All right, welcome back. We're going to look at VSEPR, molecular structure, and polarity in today's talk. Specifically, VSEPR stands for valence shell electron pair repulsion, and that has an influence over both the shape and polarity of molecules. So if you didn't catch this yet, this is an acronym for valence shell electron pair repulsion. The repulsion comes because electrons are negatively charged, and since negatives don't like to be other, next to other negatives, they repel each other. And we're only talking about the valence shell electrons, and that's why we're going to be using Lewis structures to talk about this. VSEPR helps us predict actual molecular shapes based on true evidence um, that wouldn't occur otherwise. And this is happening because these bonds are arranged to minimize repulsive forces and get as far apart from each other as possible. In order to make that happen, VSEPR talks about something called hybridization. And hybridization is where we take multiple things together to get a better outcome. Like a hybrid car takes an electric motor and a gasoline engine and puts them together in order to come up with a better product. So hybridization is where we're going to take multiple orbital shapes and put them together to increase the distance between these electron uh, pairs that like to repel each other. We know about S-shaped orbitals and P-shaped orbitals and if we only had these, the evidence that we collect from experiments wouldn't make sense. So there's the predicted result is we hybridize those two together to make uh, better angles for these bonds to occur at. These better angles um, largely come from something called sp hybridization. That's only when we take s and p. Um, since we have one s orbital and then there's three p orbitals, that sums together for four total orbitals, which would be four sp hybrid orbitals. When all four sp hybridized orbitals form, we call that sp3 hybridization because we're taking the 1s and then the p's, there's three of them, and we're putting them together. Now, this occurs when we have uh, four either bonds or electron pair uh, units coming off of a central atom. Sometimes we need to do more than that. If we need to do more than the four electrical units coming off of the atom, the central atom, we would have to add d orbitals to make that happen. And that's where we can recruit those d sublevel orbitals uh, to increase our bond angles for um, minimizing the electron uh, repulsive forces between different electron pairs. Recall that central atoms that live in the third energy level or lower, so energy level 3 or row 3 on our periodic table or lower, can break that octet rule. And that's what we're talking about here. We would have a fifth orbital get added in order to increase bond angles. Um, sp3 hybridization is the one that we do most often though and one reason for that is that carbon can do sp3 hybridization. It can make four total bonds and right there's our four and since carbon is such an important factor in a lot of the biological molecules um, sp3 hybridization is really important for um, the science especially in the life sciences. So to recap these geometries that we're going to be talking about here in the next slide are a result of combining orbitals and it's all to minimize that electron pair repulsion that we were talking about earlier. So here's our steps in order to determine the molecular ge geometry of a substance. First we have to begin with a uh, Lewis structure, so have that done first. That's why we learned how to do Lewis structures already. Then what you're going to need to do is count the number of electrical units coming off of that central atom. Now let me be careful with how I say that. Electrical units, that could be bonds or electron pairs. A single bond, a double bond, or a triple bond count as one electrical unit. So even if there's multiple pairs, a bond is only one unit. Um, whereas a lone pair would also be one unit. So then we're going to have a code that represents uh, what's going on in our Lewis structure. We could have multiple central atoms, so you could do one of these codes for each central atom. If you happen to have multiple central atoms, you can't use both central atoms as a, you need to do a separate code for each central atom. So in this case, central atom is going to be A. There will never be a subscript on A. If you're drawing a subscript on A, you probably have a molecule of two central atoms and you need to uh, separate those two central atoms for two different codes. Then you're going to count the number of bonds. So don't forget that a double, single, or triple bond all count as one. This can have a subscript. So B can have a subscript. A won't have a subscript. B can have a subscript, and that's the number of bonds. All of them count as one. So if you have a double bond and a single bond, that would be B subscript 2, B2. 
Finally, lone pairs attached to the central atom only, only on the central atom, are going to be represented as a capital E. And then lone pairs can also have a subscript. Um, so it might be like E or E2 or E3. Um, the subscript 1 would be omitted for both B and for E. Then once you make that code, you're going to look that code up on a resource sheet that you are provided. And that's going to tell you the shape of that actual molecule. So because these shapes are in a certain way, this can also influence polarity. Now, um, the shape of this molecule is important because we're going to find out that you can have a polar covalent bond but not have a polar molecule if the shape doesn't reinforce that polar covalent bond. The concept of polar, again, goes back to the, that idea of two ends on a molecule. You have a positive end and a negative end of the molecule. And then in order for us to determine these, I'm going to give you a set of questions that you can ask to make that happen. This molecule here, it's water, it's a very familiar molecule, happens to be a polar molecule because it has a negative end and then it has a positive end. This is a result of having a polar covalent bond in which the electrons spend more time by oxygen. Um, and then these bonds don't cancel each other out, in fact they reinforce each other. And that's why we have a polar covalent um, bond resulting in a polar overall molecule. So here are the questions that you're going to ask yourself to determine if a molecule happens to be polar. The first thing you need to ask yourself is, is my central atom 100% surrounded by the exact same thing? The exact same thing. That means even no lone pairs. There's only one type of atom stuck to it. If you can say yes to that, that molecule will be nonpolar because there aren't any ends to that molecule. It all looks the same. There isn't a distinct difference between sides of that molecule. If you say no to that question, you also need to go to question number two to determine if your molecule is polar or not. If you can go to question two, ask yourself, do these um, atoms that are stuck to my central atom create different polarities? If they're not different polarities and your, your um, dipoles cancel out, then you're going to have a nonpolar molecule. If the polarities are different of these polar covalent bonds, then you will have a polar molecule. Most times when you get to question two, you're going to be saying yes because almost always the polarity in these bonds that are attached to the central atom are going to be a polar covalent bond and that will result in a polar molecule. To recap, what you should have learned is that uh, VESPER stands for valence shell electron pair repulsion and it's a way of predicting the shapes of molecules that minimizes the repulsive forces between electrons that are negatively charged. These um, shapes of molecules are a result of hybridization, and that creates different geometries. The geometries are determined by creating a code by counting the number of bonds and electron pairs stuck to the central atom. These geometries have an influence on polarity because polarity is a result of both polar covalent bonds and the shape of the molecule. They have to work in tandem together. I hope that helps today.